Whoops, no, that's not what I want to do. <clears throat> Wrong browser. Don't want to bring that one up. But let's see what it looks like on the screen here. Firefox. Okay. Let me do a speed test, by the way. For some reason. Oops. I'm going to try this. Oh, man, I got... Okay. For some reason, yesterday I was uh, yesterday I hooked up my Chrome box, which I hadn't hooked up in a long time, and used it. I couldn't get. Uh, I mean, I was getting over 100 megs down, 20 up, but I wasn't getting. Um, and uh, that was with Wi-Fi and with Direct Connect. I wasn't getting the 400 down. And uh, what's going on? Uh, I think something's gone on with the networking card or the card in. Hmm. Well, I guess I should. Uh, Uh, let's see, what is uh, Google Wi-Fi? Okay, 12 is on, Howard is online, 12 devices connected. I can't see what you can, I think I'm going to have to hook up my other monitor next to this one, just so I can have the control panel. Uh... Let's see here. Something's going on. Network check. Test internet speed to your home. Okay. Connecting to the Google server. Testing download speed. There again, I can't see what you can see. Well, let me see if I can see what you can see this way. Oh, okay. Okay. Testing upload speed. This was not the purpose of this video, by the way. This was a video I got. I'm pissed off about a bunch of, I don't know, I'm an old man. I'm 78. I get pissed off about, okay, yeah, that's 215 down, 20 up. It should not, it should be faster than that. Test the mesh, okay. Testing connections to the Wi-Fi. Uh, ooh, I wonder if that, you know, I wonder if, no. Something's wrong. I pay $100 a month just for internet speed. And I pay an extra 10 or whatever for week. Okay, it should not be week. Test Wi-Fi. I'm connected though with a network uh, or with a cable into this computer. Testing Wi-Fi to connect to devices. Yeah, we're not getting that. I don't want to pay $100 a month for and only get 200 down when I'm supposed to get 400 down. Okay, we didn't want to see this anyway. Let's go to uh, testing Wi-Fi to all connected devices. Helicopter. Well, a whole bunch of things pissed me off today. The helicopter situation. I spent, uh, uh, I don't know what the date was. That. Oh, okay. I think if I remember correctly, no devices were found. Oh, in the office. Which room did I name as office, you know? Um, 
I think it would be like uh, pretty close to the for Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. Oops, it was a, a case. I do have a problem here, um, and this is not the time to. I will mess with that uh, later. Um, we did have a power outage yesterday, but I think I was it after that we were out without power for. I maybe just need to reboot everything. Uh, let's see. Well, maybe I can do a search here. <clears throat> let's try this. <clears throat> Life flight, uh, let's see. Kansas City, Missouri, that was our first helicopter. Uh, okay, purchase, make a donation. 40 years of service, okay. <clears throat> when, that, what, when would that be? Uh, that would have been also, uh, so 40 years, let's see. When is it now? Okay. Uh, okay. So 40 years ago, keep that in mind. Um, I had moved to a new, I moved to Belton, Missouri, and I applied to be a reserve officer with the Belton Police Department, and the chief of police turned me down because I was a commissioned as a private officer in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, and he thought there'd be some, which there was, you know, there'd be some type of a, where well, there wouldn't have been, because they had uh, security officers in Kansas City, Missouri, who were also uh, reserve officers with Can and the Kansas City Police Department didn't have a problem with that. But so anyway, I didn't know that there was a. So anyway, I joined the volunteer fire department. North, I forget what they were called. Northwest CAS. They changed their names a few times, and. Uh, That's when roots, okay, I want to do that. When did roots come out? Let's see. So I guess I could just do roots. Um, 1977, okay, 40 years. 70, 1977, are we in the... Uh, so... Uh, I was, a bunch of us, about seven or ten, were going through the training <coughs> for the volunteer fire department. And then I found out that the local police department had reserve police officers. And <coughs> they only had, that's all they had. They didn't have full-time police officers or a full-time dispatcher or anything else. So I volunteered for that and uh, was in training and accepted and became a officer well um, the I've told this story before but that's well the reason I can remember it uh, those of us who were the firefighters were waiting for our permit so we could have blue lights and a siren on our vehicle. <clears throat> and uh, I already had a blue light and uh, siren on my vehicle, but I never used a siren. And the blue light I had covered up with a stocking cap, so it didn't show. But everybody was waiting, and probably the others did too, maybe. 
except some would want to, you know, light some top of their vehicle. And uh, by the way, for those of you here in the United States, and maybe well elsewhere too, in the United States, in some jurisdictions, um, um, police use red lights, and in some jurisdictions, they use blue lights. And in actually a lot of jurisdictions, I, the, the police will mix them up, you know, red and blue lights or whatever. In Missouri, blue lights for, for the police for the fire department. And uh, and for the volunteer firemen, of course, they would be, you know, blue lights. But anyway, the night, I think Roots was either uh, five days or four days. It seemed to me it was four days, and I think I looked this up not long ago. But uh, for the last night, everybody in that, that's before cable television and satellite TV, or was it that, well, be, you know. So everybody in the United States was watching uh, the last episode of Roots, and the tone went off for uh, the volunteer fire department. In the United States, some volunteer fire departments, uh, they used pagers. I'm not sure after that, you know, I think they used pagers, they used walkie-talkies, the tone goes out, you know, on the frequency, it, 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 or, you know, whatever different, and in some small, you know, volunteer fire departments, you know, their small town or whatever, and they will set off, when they send out the tone or whatever, it also sets off, and maybe if you watch some YouTube videos, if you happen to see a YouTube video of a fire run or whatever, you'll wonder, what, why is, you know, you'll be watching the video and you'll see these people rushing to the fire station, but you'll hear this god-awful loud tone, they set it off on top of the fire department, so people that, you know, don't have walkie-talkies on or that are working, like somebody who owns a grocery store or whatever, they could also, you know, hear it and respond. So anyway, last episode of Roots, everybody's watching it. And, oh, and all this time I've been in the training, <laughs> when the tone had, now a couple of times the tone had gone out and I responded like down the street to a house, you know, because I was there. I mean, it was right down the street from me and I responded. Uh, but I was doing that because I it was right down the street from me. But all the times that I was responding to get to the fire station, I never made it in time. I would pull up in the parking lot just as the fire truck was pulling out. They already had the people on it they needed. Now there might have there was I think another fire truck there if it had been needed. Of course I wouldn't I wasn't trained, you know, and I wouldn't have taken it out anyway, you know, by my it would have to be with other but I never made it. Okay, the night of uh, Roots, um, I got there. Nobody else showed up. Fire chief and I went out. We came back. It was it was in a week. It was handled by us. No problem. Nothing big. I can't re can't remember what it was. Uh, we came back and we're in the fire station and the uh, fire dispatcher, whatever, gets a. I guess it, the dispatcher for the fire department was also dispatcher for the police department, which we didn't, you know, we had actually with me, that made seven, one each night a week. I patrolled for years before we finally got a full-time officer. And when he came on duty, he came on the midnight shift. But so for us, <clears throat> the volunteers, it was left up to us. I mean, they, we knew what our night was and, uh, I'd go in at like 7 p.m., and I was one of the few. I think most of the other guys, because I think I either patrol, I think I patrolled there for years Sunday night, and I had Monday and Tuesday off, so I would stay over to 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning or something like that. And then actually when we got our first full-time officer who worked a midnight shift, I actually stayed over longer because I didn't want to leave him out there, although I had been for years <laughs> out there by my, and everybody else had by themselves. I didn't want to leave him out there by himself. So I would stay over, you know, because I didn't have to work the next day. And the other guys, one was an electrician. Uh, I can't remember. All they really, all really nice guys. Um, but anyway, so we're in the fire station and the uh, Raymore officer calls and says, uh, 
to the fire dispatcher or also, you know, dispatcher for him. How many firefighters responded on that fire? And the dispatcher said, I, I don't know. And the chief of fire chief said, God damn son of a bitch, none of his, you know, F word business or whatever. I go, oh, shit. Uh, you know, because he, nobody, you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm standing there with him, you know, thinking, what should I say? You know, should I just, should I say, uh, chief, <laughs> no hard feelings. I understand, you know, you're, you're upset and, and everything, but just want you to know I'm a, you know, I'm a Raymore police officer and no hard feelings and nothing. And I'm not going to repeat, you know, what you said or anything like, but I didn't say anything. And then, uh, shortly after that, uh, well, shortly after that, we the fire department has their monthly meeting or whatever it was, and we all showed up for that, and we're in there, and the fire chief says, oh, the homecoming is coming up uh, next week or whatever, and I've already made out the assignments for all of you. Uh, no exceptions. I've made out the assignments. That's where you're going to be, and there's you can't give me any excuses. That's what you're going to be. And he told everybody what their assignment. I forget what my assignment was. First aid station, I can't remember, you know, watering, uh, place to distribute water because it was hot, hot, hot. This was in Missouri in like August or something, I think. And uh, I said, uh, sorry, Chief, I can't make it. Why can't you make it? I said, I'm working for the fire department that day because they, or I'm working for the police department that day. Oh, man face goes red then he's talking to the turns the dispatcher dispatcher is the guy who was on the radio that you know that night and dispatcher is like uh, uh, looking you know they're looking at him you know, <laughs> whatever so then after that we're all waiting for our our fi training is finished we're all waiting for our cards from the fire department now I had changed I still had my siren on my private vehicle which was a Volkswagen rabbit and I, the blue light, I had changed the thing on it to a red light, but I still kept it covered with, although I was authorized to use it by the, you know, I still kept it covered for years with a stocking cap, and I never, ever used, I think maybe once I did, an officer needed backup or something, and I wasn't even in town. I was coming through town, and I, I don't think I turned the siren on. I think I might have turned the, the. Uh, I didn't turn the siren on because the officer who by then by by that time we had, no that was a reserve officer too, but he was working, well he was working that. Uh, there was like forty motorcyclists coming through town. Fifty eight highway, and this guy. Stops one. For some reason, I mean they weren't coming through town with guns. <laughs> they weren't coming through. I don't think they were going real fast, you know. He stopped one, and all of them stopped. And then he was on the radio. Uh, I just stopped a uh, motorcycle for speeding, and all the others have stopped. So I, you know, picked up speed coming on, you know, to, to back him up. It would have been two of us against 40. You know? But it wasn't necessary. I got there, and... And I, I don't know anything about motorcycle. You know, I was like, oh, wow, what, you know? Yeah, that's a Harley, uh, you know, 260 cc. Oh man, that's you know. I'm just, and I'm not in, uh, I'm not in uniform or anything. I just come from the hospital, from not from working at the hospital. I had to visit somebody that was a friend that was in the hospital, and I was coming. But anyway, so that's the only. But anyway, we're all waiting for our permit. And then I had, the guys were like, why haven't we got our permit? And I'm thinking, oh, crap. I got a reason. Anyway, I told this story to you before, but you're going to hear it again. So anyway, I get called not to talk to the chief, but to talk to the assistant chief. Both of them were really nice guys. I mean, I didn't, I mean, I didn't know him. It was like, you know. So I go in, and I kind of like this story. You know, uh. And he says, uh, Jim, uh, we found out that you are, you know, you're a Raymore police officer. I said, oh, okay. 
and he says, uh, uh, you, you can't be on a firefighter and a police officer. Uh, you can't be, you know, and I said, uh, I already, and of course, by the way, I'd already made up my mind. <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a fire. I didn't go, going to go rushing in to, unless I had to. I mean, unless I, as a, even as a citizen, if I, you know, but I didn't want to be rushing into burning buildings. And I, that, it's being a firefighter is dangerous work. It's dirty. You take the truck out, you have to clean the truck. You get called to jobs that, you know, I much prefer being in a patrol car with a shotgun and uh, all those lights, my own, you know, vehicle. I mean, you know, the police department vehicle and and uh, hopefully not going to get dirty. Sometimes you do have to get dirty if you, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, no, I already figured out. I, I, uh, so, but anyway, so I knew when I went in, you know. And he says, you can't be both, you know. And I said, why not? Well, if there's a fire, how would we, when you show up, how would we know who, you know, who you were, whether you were coming as a fireman or a policeman? And I said, well, if I show up and I have an ax, I'm a fireman. If I show up and I have a gun, I'm a police officer. Uh, I, I, no, no, you can't. So, you know, I was just screwing with it. And I didn't tell him I was just screwing with it. I said, well, okay, well. Thanks a lot. I've enjoyed the training and uh, whatever. So then the guys, other guys got their, you know, got their cards. Oh, but what I was going to say was, uh, okay, where are we? Back here? Yeah, the helicopter. Uh, uh Anyway, St. Joseph, well, anyway, St. Joseph Hospital started their life flight. And uh, this was about the time of roots. And, but I was no longer, the, you know, with a volunteer fire department doing my training. Uh, they took their life flight all around because they definitely wanted the business, the police departments and all, you know, towns all around. And they, they went to, uh, you know, the, Raymore, which was Northwest Cass or whatever it was called at that time, you know, there to show it to the volunteer firefighters, and they were like, "Oh my God, a helicopter, helicopter!" You know. And so, actually, the um, I was on patrol by myself, of course, and so anyway, the, they were. It, Life Flight was hoping, and, I'm, and maybe they did get a few calls, but they hadn't been out to, you know, Belton, Raymore, you know, whatever. That they wanted to, but I was on patrol and uh, actually got a call that a car was stalled in a, in the highway, J Highway. And would I check it? So I go out and I come to the city limits, but I keep going outside the city limits because it's actually right up a hill and I come over and bang, there it is. Uh, two cars demolished uh, and uh, turned out there were two brothers in a car. One deceased right there when I got there. And uh, the other, I couldn't get him. I was having trouble getting him to Late, he was up walking around, but he was, I didn't know at the time how badly he was hurt. But anyway, I got on the radio and called. By then, that time we did have our own dispatcher, I believe. Yeah. I uh, called, and then I was trying to think of, because everybody monitored the frequency. And it was a small town, small community, and the fire department, you know, everybody monitored it. And I couldn't, and there was a problem in Kansas City, Missouri, where I worked as a security officer at a hospital. Uh, we didn't really, but in there, they, I forget it was what the code was, 10, 10 something meant, and if, if it, J1 or J2 or J, one, one of those was left the scene of an accident, the other was fatality, but in the community that I worked, and in that area, the 
the code was the code was different. Same number, but the J1, J2, or J3 meant a different thing. So, but anyway, I, I couldn't, which one is which? I can't, I don't know. And I didn't want to put the wrong one out. But anyway, I, I got on the radio and said, you know, traffic accident here. And I told the dispatcher, who was a reserve, by the way, not a reserve police officer, but we had reserve, at that point, we had reserve dispatchers. Uh, they weren't always there. If they weren't, then we used Cass County Sheriff's Department frequency. And the problem was with that, Cass County would have, for an entire county, maybe, you know, they might have two or three officers out. Not usually, especially for a while. They had no money. So the sheriff's deputy would couldn't afford to use gas. He'd be at the, and so once he showed up, uh, I guess the dispatcher and him probably went to the break room and were drinking coffee or whatever. It was, oh, man. But anyway, I got on the radio, and I, I said, you know, a bad traffic accident here, you know, 1050, and uh, bad accident. Have, uh, you know, Northwest Cass roll everything they've got. So they, you know, so they came out, and then the fire chief or whatever, ordered in the helicopter and that was the first time that life flight flew there and and then I found out years later well at that point I'm not sure no when I when I showed up on the scene the the one brother said my brother's dead you know he's dead and uh, so anyway I guess I did know so anyway the uh, I was dispatched to go into Raymore and tell the mother and father that uh, they should go to St. Joseph Hospital. Not the St. Joseph's emergency facility that was close by, but to the main hospital. So I drove there, you know, drove over there, went up, you know, and they came to the door and I said, uh, I've been, uh, I was sent over here to tell you that uh, there's been an accident and uh, uh, your son is involved. Uh, well, both our sons are together, you know. And that all I know is that uh, I was told to come here and tell you that your son has been taken to St. Joe's Hospital. Don't go to the emergency facility. Go to the main hospital. Your son's been taken there. And then they, you know, I sat out in front a little bit and they came out and they left. I still feel bad about that. I mean, I think I handled it. Uh, correct, but and that was sad. But anyway, years later, there was a story, something, you know, maybe it was the 10th anniversary of Life Flight or something like that. And it turned out that that brother who was, he was seriously, the one, there was one dead. The other was seriously, seriously injured. I forget what he, a lot more serious than uh, I realized. And, uh, but he ended up, I think, in a wheelchair for the rest of his life or something, but he was dispatching. He then got hired in by, you know, Life Flight, and he was, uh, I believe, I believe he was in a wheelchair. Anyway, so, so I've been around these. Then the hospital that I worked for, they came on board with a competitor eventually for the life flight, Eagle. And I could I could talk about that. So then the hospital that when I worked at the main well, wherever I worked at when I worked for the hospital, I was, you know, involved if I was at the main hospital and I worked there for well the first five years I worked there we didn't have the helicopter. Then I left, ended up going back for a while and then I had to deal with it there but at the other the small hospital I had to deal with I was the only officer on duty you know hospital security officer on duty actually there was two when I wasn't there the other guy was there but we didn't have coverage around the clock but we had I had to deal with uh, dealing with the helicopter and actually they ER was so understaffed that because uh, we were a small hospital that uh, most of the time, the nurses, there'd be two of them, ER doc, 
two, and uh, that was it. Well, then years later, there was a house supervisor who would come down. Maybe she could help out. But I was usually like, you know, Jim, order the, you know, order the eco for us or whatever. So there's stories involved, you know, involved there. But anyway, this was not a uh, medical, you know, helicopter here that crashed in New York City. Well, well, it says crashed. I think they're talking about, well, then they're talking about a hard landing. I mean, there's a, I think, a, a difference, you know, helicopters flying around, oh, crap, you know, we're going down, or helicopter, I'm going to land here, and then, bang, something happens, you know, and, but, uh, as hospital security officers, you know, especially because we had the Eagle, once a year, we had to have an orientation for an hour or so on what to do, you know, how to, how to turn off the rotors, you know, if a helicopter crashes or whatever, and the engine is still going, you know, here's the button you can push to turn off the rotors if you can, if you don't get, you know, chopped up into little pieces or whatever, and then other things on how, you know, making sure the landing pad is secure, making sure we, you don't have somebody that decides to commit suicide by having the blades, you know, or that you don't have somebody that's, you know, kind of a family or somebody or even employees that want to go out and see the helicopter landing and you have to make them, you know, leave the area so they don't get gravel thrown in their eyes and have damage to their eye all this time and make sure cars don't, you know. So there was, a, you know, a lot to it, but I sort of had a little history of the, but then there's more having to do with, uh, you know, I worked um, this, I didn't intend to be talking about this I, I was working at this research Belton hospital that we, you know the uh, small hospital and been divorced for I don't know 10 years or something like that and from the very beginning the uh, deal with my ex-wife was you know I, I paid all I Gave her the house, signed the house over to her. Gave her a car that my father used to be a union official, and that when he retired, uh, you know, he had like a, almost a brand new car, and the, you know, I got that car because uh, I was, you know, the only. Well, I guess my mother could have had it, but she was. I'm not sure if she had Alzheimer's then or not, but she was. Uh, had medical problems, so I got the car, but and then I got a divorce, so my ex-wife got that car all paid for, and had had, because it was a union car, a company car, it had had, oh, you know, it was taken, had been taken good care of, um, and then I took all the bills, and I paid child support, and why did I get started on Oh, I know it, yeah. So from the very beginning, it was, you know, I, I'm paying child support, and uh, is it okay, I'm, because I ask, you know, is it okay if I take the kids as a deduction? I'm fine. Then years later, she moved in with our four kids, with her mother, and so then that first year or whatever, I called and said, you know, now that you're living with your mom and everything, is... Uh, is it okay if I still take the kids as a deduction? Yeah. And I said, well, ask your mom, you know. So, you know, she says, Jim wants to, yeah, that's okay. So, three or four years later, I get a thing to report to the Internal Revenue Service to be audited. I was like, God, I don't make, are they auditing night watchmen, you know? I don't make that much money, and plus, I'm paying child support, you know, so I go down and they, it wasn't in their regular IRS, they had rented like what used to be a mall or something or other, and there was no barricades really, you know, so, and my hearing is bad, by the way, I guess I could hear certain ranges, you know, and this was, I guess, an ideal place for my hearing to maybe work, and I'm sitting there, and I can hear all men, and all these, sort of like, because it was like a, 
you know, they have these giant pillars that go up, and they had some tables set up there, and then giant pillar go up, tables over here, and I'm sitting on, you know, a giant pillar with a, you know, they didn't have a, didn't have a noose hanging down or anything, but I'm sitting there, and I can hear men saying, child support, uh, you know, whatever, at each one of these tables, and I thought, eh, well, nothing to worry about, you know, and uh, so the IRS person comes over, and, you know, name, social security number, that type of thing, uh, on your child support here, I've got paid child support, huh? and he says, uh, you claim the, these uh, four children as uh, deductions, yes, I do, been doing it every year since the divorce and everything. Well, somebody else claimed them as dependents. And I said, well, I, I checked on that, been doing it. I said, uh, yeah, my wife did work, you know, that year. Didn't make work very long, didn't make much money. I said, I don't think. I said, so who claimed them? I uh, can't tell you that that's confidential information. I said, uh, you can't tell me who claimed my four children on that. No, that's confidential information. I said, well, how do I, I, you know, I've paid the child support, or, you know, I paid, I've taken that deduction every year, and now you're saying I, I can't, and you I can't tell you confidential. I said, well, I know my ex-wife worked a little bit that year, and hasn't worked after that. I said, can you check the next year? Because my wife didn't work at all. He said, sure. <laughs> well, I guess kind of maybe dumb of me, but oh no. I mean, I always paid my taxes, you know. Not like some people. Uh, who become president of the United States. Um, come back. Yep. Uh, Somebody else claimed your kids that year, you know, your children, or your, I don't think that kids, your dependents, you know, whatever. I said, it's got to be my mother-in-law. My ex-wife moved in with her mother. I said, but, I said, it's got to be my mother-in-law. Can't tell you that. That's confidential information. And uh, I said, it was well, got to be. I said, he says, now you can dispute this, and uh, <clears throat> we can't tell you who says, but we, you know, you can dispute and say that you, and I said, well, no, if, if it's my mother-in-law, my ex-wife moved in with four kids, and my ex-mother-in-law is, you know, paying, you know, house payment and electricity and telephone and and I'm sure she could prorate it and all that kind, you know. Uh, and I, so guy, you know, okay, well that will be. Uh, I'd always got a refund every year of because I overpaid, so I would once a year um, get a um, refund, and I'd take the kids and um, buy them something. Take them to buy them something. Every each one of them something. Take them to a movie. Take them out to eat. And it was at Christmas, but it wasn't at Christmas time. It was in April. And uh, so the Internal Revenue says, "Okay, well that will be." And I always got like fifteen hundred dollars, or was it twelve hundred? I think it was fifteen hundred refund. And he says, okay, well, you owe $3,000 to make the check. And I, well, I said, I don't have $3,000 or whatever. And uh, so anyway, I said, how are we going to do this, you know? Well, you can make payments or whatever. So I took a, man, this is a long story. <laughs> So I was working hospital security at a small hospital, and I took a job two or because I was off two or three nights a week, depending. Can't remember now when. So I took a job at a Menorah Medical Center, a big hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. So I worked every night for about a year, or not. I mean, every night that I was off. 
for a year and in order to pay the money. While I was there, the uh, the guys, were, well, one of the guys was, man, he was an asshole. I had contact one of the security officers there. Man, he was a prick. And I had a story sort of, you know, about him. I think I mentioned that one time, too. Uh, anyway, he was a prick. But the other guys were okay, except they just thought that they were smarter than they were. And they just wouldn't learn anything. I mean, I had, I didn't go there and say, hey, I've been a hospital security officer for X number of years or anything like that. I just went there and went into work every night. But um, uh, so, and then two, one of the things I hated one of the things that I hated was, well, just the way they did everything down there. Uh, so I work in the midnight shift. In the morning, one security officer had to take the patrol car and go to the parking garage and sit on level five of the parking garage. And it used to be level one, but somebody did something on level five, and then we're talking about knee-jerk security, you know. So then whoever was in charge of security decided that the patrol car should set at level five. So you went there and you sat there at, at early in the morning and uh, you were on level five because that's where employees who came in had to park starting at level five and up, not level one to four. You know, you had to park level. So you sat there and I forget how long it was, two hours or something like that. But if you, so I volunteered to, to do that. Now, if you, for that officer, he couldn't go to take a, a 30 minute breakfast lunch, you know, because it was, you know, this was midnight shift, man, breakfast would be great. So I passed up, it doesn't look like I passed up breakfast, but I, so I went out there to do that because you would have to, if the weather was rainy or something like that, you had to take out a bus, like a school bus, and drive it a block or two blocks down to another parking lot and let the employees who parked in that parking lot get in the bus and then you drove them up two blocks or whatever. I didn't want to do that. But you didn't have to do that every day. It depended on what the weather, you know, whatever. But I, I, I volunteered, so they were happy. <sighs> but... So this one day, you know, I'm, I'm down there, and then I come up, and by the time I came up, time to go to the office and turn in my activity sheet and everything, and this is what I mean about them not telling anybody, one, not passing on information to anybody, to the other officers, and not, you know, so anyway, I get up to the office. So we're, we're checking out and everything, and they said, well, oh, Life flight never showed up. And I said, what? The helicopter, you know. St. Joseph helicopter. Uh, they called and said they were coming down, you know, bringing us a patient, but they haven't showed up. And uh, I said, and by the way, for that hospital, they had no helicopter landing pad. They had, and it was morning rush hour and they were in the inner city you know the they had to shut down a street when they got word they had to go out and shut down the street so the helicopter and this is a street people were using to go to work they had to go down and shut that down and i said uh did you check with life flight yeah we just called them and they said no they they weren't coming i said did you check with eagle no we didn't check with eagle that was the helicopter for the company that I worked for. Uh, they said it was Eagle when, when they called. And I said, people all the time, everybody confuses because Life Flight was first. People, they don't even, sometimes they don't, when it's the Eagle, they'll say, Eagle won't, but they'll say, Life, I said, you need to check with, you know, no, we don't. And it was, it was sort of like, you know, we work here at Menorah, you know, and, uh, 
And then I heard, the, you know, the helicopter, and they were like, oh, shit. I said, yep, that's Eagle up there in the air, you know, <laughs> waiting for the intersection, waiting for the street to be cleared or whatever. So eventually I paid off the Internal Revenue Service. Um, okay, this was not... I'm going to end this here so I can, this is, this will be easy. Uh, otherwise, if I go into, well, let me say for those of you following me, two of my Corridor's catfish have passed away. So I'm now, I started with five. One died almost immediately. And then one died in, in the morning and one died at night. I don't know why. I know what the water temperature is. I've never checked the pH or anything like that. Um, so I ordered in a, a sponge and a, I have a uh, filter on the back of the tank. I ordered in a sponge filter and I ordered in some air stones and a pump, air pump so I can pump. So I don't know what's going on. Well, I know those, the fish that I bought at uh, Pitco, no, the Corridors did not look good. And one died almost immediately. So I will say that I'm not going to put in the, and that's just an extra for you. So I was going to cover other stuff. And an emergency, a passenger on a flight that was on the ground wanted to go to the restroom and opened up the emergency exit on the aircraft, and the, the ramp went down. They were delayed seven hours, though the passengers had to get off, not using the ramp, of course, but, uh, you know, the seven hours, that plane was, because I guess you have to, I don't know, probably roll the ramp up, and there's probably something involved, you know, to, uh, you don't just press a button, it comes back, okay, we're ready to, you know, I'm sure they have to check, you know, the stuff, so. Did you see a thing about the bakery that was uh, awarded $11 million? A small town, I guess, or not real small. In Ohio, I never heard of Obelene College, but I, I guess uh, there was a, a bakery in town, and they supplied for the school. You know, they had a contract or whatever they supplied, and three, two or three black men, students, I think it was, ended up getting arrested in the the bakery. And uh, members of the staff, you know, faculty or whatever, handed out leaflets and all kinds of things saying that the bakery was racist. And, I mean, you know, big time. They just made big time. And the, the, the bakery business, because there was other bakery, other or others, their business went by like that. And uh, turned out these three... young black men who, who were arrested. One was, oh, uh, well, anyway, they were guilt, you know, one was trying to obtain liquor and he was underage and he was being, you know, do you have an ID? And he got belligerent or whatever. The other two, I forget what they stole something or did something or whatever. Anyway, the bakery which I guess man was hurt because these things take, you know, years um, in law in court to you know to settle. They end up getting eleven million dollars. The story says, you know, um, the college isn't sure if the, the college is still like deny. Well, yeah, no, well, you know, we didn't do anything wrong. Uh, they definitely did, you know. Um, the but the last thing, and well, the college is uh, not sure if they're going to appeal it. What would be great if this is all true, which apparently it is. I think it's, a, in my opinion, a clear-cut case that the college professors and whatever uh, slandered, libeled, I'm not sure, what, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Um, 
what would be great would be if, and I don't know if this depends on probably on state law, what would be great, well, of course, it would probably be great, this bakery probably really needs some money. And I think this would be enough, you know, not enough for the physical, I mean, you know, the owner or whatever may have had a heart attack or may have, you know, I mean, a breakdown or something, you know. Um, but what would be great if the bake if the uh, college, which sounds to me like they're being kind of like, we are an educational institution and uh, blah, 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 you know. What would be kind of great would be if they, well, we're going to appeal this. We will drag this out for for years until the owners die, until, the, until they go out of business, until they're willing to take a little bit of money from us and because uh, they'll need it. You know, what would be great is if they appealed it, and if it went when it went to the next judge, if the judge said, "Okay, well, I have reviewed here the everything, and uh, it's uh, clear cut that you know the college, you know, uh, injured the bakery. They put it in legalese, you know, uh, and." What I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the $11 million libel uh, settlement to the bakery. I'm going to make it $22 million. Oh, I would love that. Oh, man. If those type of things would happen, I sort of uh, did that in my hospital career or whatever it takes when I did a grievance or something against the hospital, hospitals, Trinity Lutheran Hospital and Research Medical Center for at Trinity Lutheran Hospital that I won. And uh, two at Research Medical Center, one I won and the other I lost. I knew it was, but what I always did was, okay, if I have to go this route, one, I'm doing the grievance, but I'm not asking for, I'm, you know, I'm doing this grievance where how can you say, you know, one, I know I'm 100% right, and how can you not, you know, give it to me, but what I, because I'm having to do this because you're being assholes or whatever, I then step it up, you know, I make it like, hmm, you know, and, uh, Tit for tat. That's actually what I wanted to talk about in this video, but I'm not going to do it now. I have to save it for another video. But basically, I'll give you a little thing. Make it very short. Why in the world, when what's going on in Washington or in Congress and all that type of stuff, when let's take one issue. But it would, I, would have, I would do this with everything. The massive uh, tax benefits that were given to 2% of the rich people in the United, or United States or whatever, massive amount of money, tons of money. I think Scrooge McDuck in a swimming pool with a bulldozer and the coins and he's bathing in the money or whatever from the comic books of the old days or whatever. Massive amount of money the Republicans gave to them. As soon as they gave it to them, you know, and I think that a large number of the American people did, well, okay, uh, give them all these tax benefits. They're going to, it's going to trickle down. It doesn't trickle down, by the way. We know that. Uh, you don't get any, they don't create jobs or whatever. Um, but then as soon as that happened, the American people saw then, large number of them oh crap and then of course the Republicans uh, say and the Republicans were the ones who wanted this always this tax you know give money to the rich the then the Republicans say uh, there's no money coming in or not enough money coming in for taxes there won't be and therefore we have to cut Medicare Medicaid food stamp programs, uh, 
all these things. We have to cut it because we don't have the money. We don't have the money because of this tax. And then, of course, the Republicans, uh, what? Oh, no, we are. Uh, yeah, we don't want to talk about that. You know, they, that was their big thing. I don't understand. And take other issues along the same line. Oh, for the tax benefit, the Republicans want this tax. You know. Well, I know the pro I know the reason. Anyway, but why couldn't we have worked out? Okay, you want to give these people tons of money. Let's do this. Let's make a deal. Um, and then we have something from the other side. But actually, now I know the reason. I was, I was going to go into that, but I was just remembering back in the 1990s when I was working at a small hospital, and I was the only liberal Democrat there. Everybody else was conservative Republican. And... Um, I think that's when Rush was on radio or TV or something like that. I think he was the one. And uh, the word wasn't concession. It wasn't deal. What was the word? Republicans would have nothing to do with uh, making a deal. The word wasn't deal. What was it? It wasn't concession. can't remember. But they, uh, all of a sudden it became, uh, wish I could remember the word. But anyways, I was saying, well, you know, no, no bargain, no concession, no whatever the word was. We don't, and that's the whole, <laughs> the way our government is set up, the way it has worked in the past so well over all these hundreds of years was because of uh, coming to an agreement with the other side. You know, you you negotiate, you uh, make, you know, arrangements or whatever. Okay, let's do this, but let's, you know, whatever. And the Republican thing became, no, the Democrats are the enemy. The uh, Democrats are evil. They're in collusion with the devil, and Satan is their leader. We will not make a deal. No deal-making. No concessions. No arrangements. This is it. And so that, you know, so then, these, but all these things that, came, that come up, every time something comes up, it should be, you know, okay, you want this, and what the Democrats' position should be was, well, we want something, but it should be something a little bit outrageous, or, of course, it never would be, but it should be, you know, okay, you want all this money for the rich people. It's a mistake. Well, you know, but see, the problem was the Republicans controlled, you know, the presidency, the House, and the Senate. Hell, really, you're not supposed to control, you know, the Supreme Court, but let's forget about the Supreme Court. But you know, the the, Dem the Republicans didn't need any of the Democrats. We're just going to do this. Fuck you. But, and I'm not saying that you know. But it should be like, okay, you want all this money going to the rich? We can't stomach it. It's really a, a big mistake. It's going to hurt us. But here, in order to get it, we want. Uh, free college for qualified people. Everybody will get free college if you, you know, you meet the minimum standards and you're in college and you continue to, you know, get the proper grades or whatever and something else and something else. Uh, and we should do that on every issue, but when the Republicans control stuff, uh, it, it doesn't matter. They just pass it. That's it. You know, fuck you. So anyway, sometimes I want to talk about that and give some ideas about, you know, like prescription medicines are so expensive. When the Republicans want something, say, okay, ugh, that's a bad thing, but we want uh, price controls or something, or maybe not price controls, but, you know, 
we want uh, the pharmaceutical companies, you know, to pay an excise tax, uh, pay an extra tax because you're a pharmaceutical company. If you're big and if you make tons of money because you're making that money, you know, off of these, making it off me, you know. So anyway, thank you for watching.